Sejam bem-vindos a mais uma, um evento uh, de... Boa tarde a todos, meu nome é Paloma, sejam todos bem-vindos a mais um evento de preparação para o Zoo Hackathon, o evento que vai rolar esse fim de semana, do dia 6 ao dia 8 uh, de novembro, em todo o Brasil, em todo o mundo, uh, a gente está reunindo entusiastas, designers, desenvolvedores, ambientalistas, pesquisadores, pessoas de vários, né, de vários lugares do Brasil e do para descobrir soluções e desenvolver soluções para combater o tráfico de animais. E você é convidado especial para participar desse live aqui com a gente hoje no canal do UAS, uh, que vai discutir um pouco uh, dos desafios de combate ao tráfico de animais, tanto aqui no Brasil quanto fora. Uh, hoje o nosso live vai ser super gringos, super internacional. Uh, a gente vai ter uh, o adido uh, da Embaixada dos Estados Unidos com a gente, ele vai falar um pouquinho de português, mas a gente vai ter alguns momentos onde a gente está falando inglês. Então, se você ah, não tem a fluência em inglês, mas quer usar hoje para praticar, esse é até o momento, treinar né, uma segunda língua. Ah, se você manja inglês, melhor ainda, mais um momento para a gente praticar ah, essa skill que a gente vai poder utilizar tanto ah, durante o evento, mas principalmente para os pitches finais que vocês vão enviar da competição. Uh, Para quem ainda não sabe, então, o Zoo Hackathon é esse evento que vai estar rolando esse fim de semana e você pode se inscrever ainda, as inscrições estão abertas até amanhã. Você entra no zoohackathon.was.ninja, a gente vai jogar aqui no chat uh, o link da inscrição. É um evento gratuito, está sendo patrocinado pela Embaixada dos Estados Unidos em todo o mundo uh, e aqui no Brasil também. Uh, e vocês vão poder participar desse momento onde especialistas da área de conservação, uh, especialistas da área de tecnologia e startups vão poder apoiar vocês desenvolvendo soluções para o combate do tráfico de animais. A gente já teve dois aqui no canal, então se você perdeu, dá uma olhada aí. Uh, mas essa live também vai ficar gravada, então, para quem não tem afluência no inglês, vai colocar agendas para vocês poderem acompanhar e não perder nenhum dos conteúdos que a gente vai disponibilizar aqui hoje. Uh, se você está né, animado com o fim de semana, está ansioso, a gente tem um grupo também do WhatsApp que está sendo criado, toda a comunicação do evento está sendo feita lá pelo Simpla, né, com os updates e também uh, pelo DevPost. Uh, mas se você tiver alguma pergunta também, né, de aonde se inscrever, de como participar, uh, a equipe está aqui para vocês, com qualquer dúvida que vocês tiverem. Enquanto a gente, né, uh, vai chamar agora o nosso convidado especial, uh, enquanto você assiste esse live, esse live foi feito para você tirar principalmente as suas dúvidas uh, e já começar o evento mais preparado, né, a gente tem uma série de desafios uh, que são propostos uh, pela Embaixada dos Estados Unidos para né, combate, junto com o nosso parceiro Freeland, uh, para o combate ao tráfico de animais aqui no Brasil e no mundo. Uh, e a ideia é já tirar essas dúvidas. Então, prepara as perguntas. A gente vai poder responder elas ao vivo aqui hoje. Uh, né, e você pode mandar elas tanto em português quanto em inglês. E a gente vai ter o nosso palestrante de hoje respondendo tuas perguntas ao vivo logo depois da nossa conversa. E sem mais longa, agora eu vou trocar um pouquinho para o inglês para a gente já começar né, a aproveitar esse live. I would like to uh, introduce you guys to a super special guest that we have here today. Uh, he is from the embassy of the US. Uh, he is part of the mission of the embassy in Brazil. Uh, it's Broderick. Uh, he is the attache um, in the embassy, and he's the special agent of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Division. Thank you so much, Brian, for being here with us today. We're super honored to have you uh, as a supporter of this event. Okay, muito obrigado. Uh, boa tarde a todos. <laughs> Eu sou Brian Landry. Uh, um momento, share the screen. Okay. Pessoal, enquanto o Marco compartilha a tela deles, lembrando vocês que a gente mencionou com a Juliana, mencionou ontem também, sobre aquela operação dos sapinhos da Amazônia e sobre várias outras operações realizadas em parceria do, da, das embaixadas, da embaixada aqui no Brasil. 
Ah, e para quem estava no live, vocês ficaram sabendo já já o falar do Brian. Então, quem perdeu os lives também, ah, só dá uma olhada lá que né, era ele que a gente estava falando sobre naquele live. Can you see my screen? Can you see my presentation? Brian, a gente já está vendo a tua apresentação. Can you see it? Yes. Ok, só. Ok. Ok, obrigado. Uh, eu sou o Brian Landry. Uh, eu sou o Magiro uh, para o Brasil, uma agente especial uh, do Serviço de Peixe e Vida Silvestre dos Estados Unidos. Uh, eu uh, trabalhando com uh, Serviço de Peixe e Vida Silvestre para uh, 16 anos. Agora, uh, uh, por favor, perdão meu português, é terrível, né? uh, mas uh, eu uh, vou tentar uh, para falar em português uh, um pouco e uh, algumas vezes uh, mudar para inglês, né? <risos> mas uh, uh, minha apresentação é... Uh, Is, uh, está uh, traduzido, traduzido, yeah? uh, translated. So my slides are translated, uh, but I'll try, I'll switch English, Portuguese as much as I can. I need the practice. <laughs> um, mas agora eu trabalho uh, na Embaixada dos Estados Unidos em Brasília. Uh, eu uh, trabalhando um, pelo Brasil, todo o Brasil, uh, no tráfego do Vida Silvestre, uh, entre Brasil, o Brasil e Estados Unidos. Uh, minha apresentação é o tráfego global de Vida Selvagem. Uh, vocês ouvirão mais no final de semana Uh, de especialistas brasileiros, uh, mas minha apresentação é de uma per per perspectiva uh, mais global uh, e também o que vemos nos Estados Unidos, ok? So my presentation is more from the perspective of uh, global, right? Later in the week you're going to hear uh, some presentations from Brazilian authorities that will speak more to what Brazil is encountering. But my presentation is focused more on the global nature of this problem and also what we see in the United States, which is directly connected to Brazil many times. Okay, so traffic global de vida salvagem. It's muito um grande problema. Tráfico global de madeira, pesca e vida selvagem, ao junto, uh, perde apenas para contrafações e o tráfico de drogas. Yeah? So, it's, uh, if you combine the global traffic of wood, fishery products, and wildlife together, The trafficking of those commodities are second only to counterfeiting and trafficking of drugs. So this is a, a huge global problem. Uh, so why is trafficking, is wildlife trafficking important, right? Many of us care about animals. Many of us care about wildlife. Uh, but let's say you don't care much about this issue. Why should we care? Why is this important? There are many reasons. Uh, number one, o tráfico de animais selvagens é um componente da atividade criminal organizada. So it's part of other crimes. Many times wildlife trafficking is connected to other crimes that criminals are performing. Uh, por exemplo, lavagem de janeiro e crime financeiro. Uh, também, uh, efeitos do ecosistemas 
in the aerials. So it affects entire ecosystems. For example, uh, removing coral from a living reef for the aquarium trade. The removal of that coral is going to affect the entire ecosystem. Uh, it, uh, it, uh, it affects the extinction of whole species. Uh, um example, matando henesoranchi por seu chifre. So if we think about rhinoceros and the fact that we have poachers killing rhinoceroses just for their horn, for the Chinese medicinal trade, uh, we've had species of rhinos, rhinoceros go extinct already, and many species are facing extinction just for that very reason. Uh, uh, prejudice y coleta legal. So it affects legal harvest. For example, um, if you think about sustainable fishing, uh, piruruku, a uh, species do Brazil, não é? É muito importante. Uh, think of the sustainable legal fishing for that fish versus the illegal poaching, right? So that illegal poaching component takes away that resource that could have been legally fished during a legal season. Uh, another reason, uh, it uh, takes away the availability of resources from indigenous peoples. We have this uh, problem in our own country, Estados Unidos. Uh, uh, indigena do Estado de, uh, uh, Estado de Alaska, de Alaska. Yeah? Uh, our indigenous depend on hunting and availability of marine mammals to eat, to live. And when we have poachers killing walrus, for instance, for their ivory, it affects that resource and the very lives of indigenous peoples. And I know that happens as well in Amazonas. Y también impacta industrias sustainables. So you think of uh, ecotourismo and safari businesses. Um, I uh, once went to uh, the the Pais de Malawi in Africa, and it was a beautiful country, and I helped uh, train some game rangers there. But I was really uh, impacted. I realized that Malawi, as beautiful a country as it was, their wildlife was gone. All the elephants were poached. There was no wildlife for people to visit Malawi and come see that wildlife. I told uh, one of my partners, um, colleagues in Malawi, that uh, I have a family. I have four children, my wife, and my family, I would spend $20,000 US dollars to travel to Malawi and see their beautiful country and go on a safari, except that their animals are gone, right? So there is that resource. So someone who may have gotten $1,000 for illegal elephant tusks one time, explored that resource. You missed out on all these people coming to miss to visit Malawi to see your beautiful wildlife, spending tens of thousands of dollars. So it has a uh, impact in industrial sustainableness. Tráfico de animais selvagens mata mais do que, do que apenas animais selvagens. Mais de uh, 100 guardas florestais foram mortos no ano passado. Uh, every year, around about 100 uh, game rangers throughout the world are killed uh, in the pursuit of wildlife trafficking. And this is just one example in Garamba Park in Africa of uh, rangers that were killed. So uh, in Estados Unidos, demos uh, ordens executivas prudenciais, 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 sobre o combate ao tráfico de vida selvagem e o crime transnacional. 
So we have an executive order that was signed by our past president, Obama, and a most recent executive order signed by our current president, Trump. Both of these orders uh, instruct the United States government to work on issues combating wildlife trafficking, both within the United States and globally. And a big part of these executive orders is instructing the U.S. government to work together. So in the past, Minya Agencia uh, was almost solely responsible, uh, solely responsible for counter wildlife trafficking. We're a very small, uh, pequeño, uh, pequeña agencia in the status of news. Uh, but these executive orders tell larger, mais grande agencias like FBI, that you shall work on this and you'll work with Fish and Wildlife and other agencies on this issue. So this is an important executive order. Uh, in Estados Unidos, tenemos uh, muitos leyes sobre a vida salvaje. Um, más importante es la ley uh, llama o Lacey Act. Uh, ley Lacey. Y también um, un otro ley, uh, I'll score one moment. We have more than just one wildlife law in the United States. We have many. And a lot of those laws overlap each other. We also have ultra leyes. Uh, we, uh, apocalypse selling, uh, este crime. Huh? So we use, uh, in Estados Unidos, a ley de contrabando, yeah? uh, para vida salvestre. Uh, y también a ley de conspiracy, conspiracy, conspiracy. En otro uh, leyes uh, aplica para um, uh, muchos crimes. Yeah? So these are general federal laws that we can apply to wildlife crimes. En uh, uh, crímenes uh, pueden ser combinadas con otros violaciones de la de ley. So if we have a violation of the U.S. Lacey Act, but they also smuggle that wildlife, we can combine the different laws. Combinate. Uh, it's just uh, uh, Just checking in. You guys can hear me all right? The slides are progressing. Okay. Now we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, muy importante uh, es uh, o convenio sobre comercio internacional de especies amenazadas de extinción, o CITES, as we call in Estados Unidos. En Brasil, probablemente uh, CITES. Eh? Um, <laughs> but it's un uh, tratado internacional, uh, almost uh, quasi. Todos países o mundo in the world, almost every country in the world is part of this very important treaty. As you can see, incluindo Estados Unidos y Brasil. Uh, CITES tiene como objetivo proteger especies altamente negociadas de exploración mediante un acuerdo de todos las partes para monitorar de perto o comercio de especies salvajes listadas pela uh, misión de licencias especificadas de da sites de sites. Yeah? So it's an accord, a treaty, uh, and this treaty uh, really binds us together as countries uh, to collaborate and coordinate on the trafficking. Uh, ambos flora y fauna, yeah? So not just wildlife, but also plantas, uh, maderas, yeah? Flora y fauna. It's a muy importante uh, treaty, uh, tratado. Um, and it actually works as a mechanism for countries to work together. Uh, for example, uh, Estados Unidos does not have a very good relationship with the country of Iran. 
right? I can't normally pick up the phone and work with colleagues in Iran. But guess what? Iran is part of this convention, of this treaty. And this is a mechanism where we can actually work directly with Iran on issues of wildlife trade. And a very good example of that is caviar. Caviar comes from a, an endangered fish uh, called sturgeon. We have them both in the United States and Iran has them as well. Iran ships a lot of caviar to the United States and we work with them on trade issues, both legal and illegal based on this treaty. And I can tell you that that wouldn't normally ever happen uh, except under this treaty. There really is very few mechanisms we can work with the Iran on any trade issues, but this incredible treaty is one of them. Uh, for example, uh, so this is an example of how CITES works, okay? So, um, um example, uh, a fazenda de jacarés, huh? say in Brazil, a fazenda de jacarés, uh, La Cian, so a licensed Brazilian facility, a farm. It's legal, it's, it's, it is legal, okay? Poji demonstra legal de agi. So they can demonstrate they have a legal license farm. The Fazenda de Jacarés Legal aplica e recebe permissões e etiquetas. Uh, etiquetas, huh? would that, isn't that what you would call this? This tag, uh, CITES tag, I'm not sure, como se diz em português? Etiquetas. Recebe permissões e etiquetas de exportações da CITES do Brasil. Exportações da Fazenda de Jacarés para a Itália, com permissões CITES, adequada e peles com etiquetas. So the, the tag, these, these skins have to be tagged with these CITES tags and have a CITES permit. Itália aceita remessas um conformidade com o CITES. So it, Italy can only accept those shipments if they're legally tagged and legally permitted from Brazil. O produto de coro e producida na Italia e a presa obtera licencia CITES subsequentes para exportar uh, e various países. Huh? So after all this legal mechanisms take place, Italy can then make a leather product and then export it to other parts of the world, including these other CITES countries with a CITES permit. So this is an example of how this works, how CITES works in the international trade of wildlife. Uh, there are many thousands of CITES species. Uh, many of them are birds and plants, but there are a lot of, still many, uh, muito, uh, mammalias, yeah, reptiles, uh, aves, in muito plantas, yeah? uh, they're categorized in three different appendices. Appendix um, one is the most restrictive. So this, these uh, example of appendix one species is a jaguar. So think of jaguar in Brazil. That's an appendix one species. Appendix one does not allow trade. It is so endangered that it does not allow trade. The other appendix, like Appendix 2 and Appendix 3, have lesser restrictions and they can be traded. A good example of Appendix 2 species is jacarés, uh, alligators. Yeah? So they're allowed, that's why you see uh, Louis Vuitton purses with alligator skin, right? Because if it's legal, it can be allowed. Uh, there's still a lot of illegal trade in all of these species but there's different mechanisms for each. So you have uh, um hectares, right? If it's shipped properly and it has the CITES permit under Appendix 2, it is, it is, it is allowed. We see these shipments all the time in Estados Unidos and also Brazil. Brazil exports many Appendix 2 and Appendix 3 species and also imports them. As long as the mechanisms of studies are in place, that can be allowed.
However, uh, we deal uh, a lot with uh, Fugilanchis, the Ascites. Uh, in applique soins, they permit soin. So we get a lot of false applications for permits and we see a lot of false permits. This is an example of a permit that China received and it's fake. This is supposedly a permit from the United States, but you can see that's not our seal. It's a fake seal indicated there for our management authority. And it also has a fake stamp. And there's omitted information in here. So uh, this is another opportunity where we worked with China and China sees these illegal uh, birds that are exported from the United States with this false permit. Uh, so, the service of the Peshi de Vida Silvestre dos Estados Unidos is, is, um, is como o mesmo de Ibama o Isimabio. Eh? Suas agencias a Ibama e Isimabio. É o mesmo. Um, almost the same. Uh, but it, um, uh, we are the principal. Agencia Federal Responsivo para pela conservação de plantas e animais selvagens e, e suas habitats. Uh, como se diz habitats em português? Eu não sei. <laughs> uh, but in the United States, we're responsible not only for these animals and wildlife and plants, but also their habitats. Uh, we have uh, temos o sistema nacional refúgio de vida selvagem, um, 50, 60 sanctuários de vida selvagem pelo Estados Unidos. Uh, e muito uh, pescas, uh, como se diz fisheries? Uh, I don't know how to say uh, fish hatchery. Um, uh, 72 uh, incubadores de peixes nacionais. I don't know if that makes sense, but we have many fish hatcheries, national fish hatcheries, e laboratorios de saúde de peixes, e um, uh, muitos uh, estações de serviço ecológico, uh, uh, como a uh, Simobio, like a Simobio, uh, scientific services. And then, in town, we have the Office of Law Enforcement, which is what I work for, yeah? Uh, Fiscalização, yeah? Eu trabalho com uh, fiscalização, uma uh, uh, pequena, um, well, a small part, uh, we're a smaller office, edifício de serviço de peixe de vida silvestre. So we're a much smaller component of my agency, of my agency. Uh, temos inspectores uh, da vida salvagem nos Estados Unidos, uh, trabalhei em escrita cabalerição com a uh, El Fandega dos Estados Unidos, né? uh, localizado em uh, 37 portos, uh, mais movimento habitados dos Estados Unidos, portos, aeroportos, fronteira, uh, facilitar o comércio legal e uh, interadetar o comércio ilegal, né? ambos. Both. They both intercept the illegal wildlife and also help facilitate legal trade. Um, and just so you know, in the Estados Unidos, we import uh, almost 1 million live tropical fish from Brazil every single year. Uh, commercial shipments, uh, like you can see one inspectora uh, looking at one right now, um, but we import a lot of legal wildlife from Brazil. And we also intercept a lot of illegal wildlife, unfortunately. Uh, but there is a lot of legal trade between the US and Brazil. A million fish, at least, uh, freshwater aquarium fish uh, from Brazil every year. Location, lugares do inspectores in the Estados Unidos. We have inspectors at our major US ports. And as you can see, uh, many on the frontera, uh, the border of Mexico and uh, Canada. Uh, so we have many on the border and we have many in major U.S. cities and ports. 
Uh, eu trabalho em uh, Puerto de Boston e também eu trabalho em uh, Arizona, uh, Phoenix, uh, cidade de Phoenix, Arizona. Eu trabalho em Honolulu, Hawaii também. Então, eu trabalho em uh, uh, muitos lugares nos Estados Unidos uh, para 16 uh, anos. Uh, we deal with a lot of different uh, wildlife. Uh, uh, one thing we deal with a lot is hunting trophies. There are a lot of cazadores, uh, dos Estados Unidos, that travel around the world and trophy hunt, and they bring their trophies back to the United States. Um, I am a specialist, an expert at identifying African wildlife <laughs> because of my time as an inspector. Uh, looking at these shipments. Uh, so we'd have to determine and make sure that there were legal species, that they were the same that were listed on permits and whatnot. Uh, so the hunter, Cazadora, uh, you see in the bottom left of the screen, uh, had just come back from the Pais de Kakistan uh, in Asia and hunted these uh, mountain sheep in elevations of over 10,000 feet. And at this time, he's telling us a story of how he, for months, tracked these sheep and hunted them in the mountains in Kazakhstan. And uh, he it was a really hair-raising story. He almost died at <laughs> time. So very interesting to speak to the Cazadores when they come back to the Estados Unidos with their trophies. And of course, we want to make sure everything's legal. Uh, so much of this is illegal. Some of it is legal, depending if the other country allows it, right? Well, Brazil, uh, nope, uh, does not permit it, right? So we, we wouldn't be clearing a trophy shipment from Brazil, but we have cleared many from uh, other parts of the world. Uh, deal with many uh, live shipments, uh, vivos, uh, animais vivos, reptiles, aves, peixes, mammals, mammals, uh, uh, mammals. Mammals, I'm not sure how to say <laughs> in Portuguese. Um, muito. E também, uh, serpentes, a uh, uh, a filme, yeah? Uh, but this could really happen, right? I've seen loose heptais, e serpentes in uh, aviões, yeah, in planes. Uh, we prevent that from happening, right? We make sure that they, uh, that they uh, package things properly. This is, you can see a package, a mesa, huh? These are spitting cobras. I don't know how you say it in Portuguese, but these are very, muito peregroso, serpentes, huh? And they're packaged in a cardboard box uh, and completely inappropriate and dangerous. And uh, anyone handling the shipment uh, is in danger of getting bitten or hurt because these boxes get crushed and uh, they get loose, right? So a big part of this job is to make sure that this does not happen, this movie. Agentes especiais, como eu, like me, uh, investigadores criminais. Uh, um, trabalho uh, com investigações secretas. Uh, uh, we do a lot of undercover work. Some of these pictures of uh, agents, agentes uh, uh, secretas on hunts in Alaska. Uh, doing undercover work, uh, aplicar leis federais uh, sobre vida salvagem e cursos naturais. Uh, uh, we also trabalho com uh, investigações internacionais sobre tráfico de vida salvagem. Uh, uh, so we do a lot of international investigations. And part of my work here in Brazil is uh, really to uh, to build transnational investigations. So we shouldn't just seize, uh, you know, illegal wildlife from Brazil, right? And just be done with it in the United States. We should work directly with Brazilian authorities so that we can have a transnational investigation of both the illegal shipper in Brazil and the illegal importer in the United States. That's muito do important, yeah? Muito do important. Uh, temos um laboratório forense uh, somente para animais selvagem em uh, estado de Oregon, 
en Estados Unidos. O único uh, laboratorio forense, totalmente certificado de mundo, uh, especializado apenas en crímenes contra la vida salvaje, uh, genéticas, balísticos, uh, panología, identificar especies y hora de muerte, uh, muerte. Uh, algunas veces uh, muy importante para investigaciones uh, uh, identifica, identifica, identify uh, 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 poisons contaminants right uh, ven venenos so much, como se dice poison in Portuguese uh, contaminants and causas de muerte uh, uh, impresiones digitais y evidencias vestigiais uh, Uh, testimoniar intra tribunal. Então, uh, our especialistas, uh, forensi, our forensic scientists, they come and testify in court for us. Uh, and so you can see a picture here of our lab uh, examining two endangered wolves in the United States that were killed by ranchers uh, intentionally. And so we have to show that the ranchers illegally shot, killed these animals. So there's a lot of uh, work that needs to be done in our lab to show the ballistics, how the animals were shot, what position they were shot, and things like that. Muy um, importante. Uh, y también tenemos un forense digital. Uh, examadores forenses digitais certificados. Uh, so we have a very good uh, digital evidence unit. And uh, these agencies uh, came from otros, otros agencias. Uh, es, estas agen, uh, estas uh, uh, agencias, estas agencias in, uh, in this picture, uh, they came from the Secret Service. So um, otra agencia, uh, they came from a different agency, but now they work for us and they only do wildlife crime cases. So they're a very, very good unit with much, much uh, experience. Uh, this is a website that's much uh, interesting. Uh, very interesting website, fws.gov, .gov, backslash lab. Um, if you're interested, you can go on this website and there's a lot of resources here on the work that our forensics lab does for wildlife crime. Uh, and so it's, it's very interesting. If you go on this website, even for 30 minutes, you'll learn a lot about illegal wildlife uh, trade and wildlife crime and some of the resources, hey, Carasos, that uh, Nosa Laboratorio, Nosa Laboratorio uh, thing, yeah, that they have there. So this is a very interesting website that you can go through. I think your browser may, uh, Uh, translate this into Portuguese as well. So just to uh, give you an idea, uh, remessas de vida salvage para um ano, uh, for just one year, uh, our major ports, uh, uh, Grange port, Portos, uh, Nueva York, uh, Los Angeles, um, some of our Miami uh, big ports, uh, a lot, uh, muito, Uh, trade, right? Commercial. Uh, ambos legal y illegal, right? Uh, but if you look, uh, we only have un cien, uh, cien y do, y, um, we have 120 inspectors in total in the United States. Uh, and they were able to, um, if you look at the numbers here, this is over for uh, $6 billion dollars worth of trade of just wildlife in, in one year uh, that they handle at these ports, these 120 inspectors. So this is, this is a lot that they deal with, uh, much like your IBAMA inspectors in uh, no Brazil. Huh? They deal with a lot of trade uh, with very few people. So, importante, uh, importação. Huh? This is uh, um, uma remessa de reptiles in Miami. Uma remessa. É muito difícil para uh, inspector uh, and to inspect. Um, you can see these boxes. These are properly 
contained because they're in uh, boxes so they can't escape. Yeah, but this is uh, very difficult uh, to inspect and look at the shipment. This shipment has hundreds of different reptile species that the inspectores must confirm, confirmar, uh, and make sure are, are legal. It is uh, very muito fácil para contrabando uh, in uh, essas remesas. Yeah? It's very easy to smuggle uh, illegal wildlife in shipments like this uh, that have declared legal wildlife, right? Because you can't inspect everything, and this is very difficult to look at. And not only that, dangerous. Many of these reptiles are uh, venomous. Uh, many of these are venomous. So you take a lot of precautions and a lot of time to inspect them. So um Hesanche, I had introduction in Miami. Uh, uh, expedis, uh, expedis, exportation, commercial, commer, commer, commercial, yeah? Amphibios, reptiles, uh, exportadas de Paraguay. Uh, usando lisan, lisanzas fraudulentas. Uh, dois, dois mil, yeah? We do. Uh, the question is, uh, what do we do with all these illegal tarantulas and amphibians and live reptiles, vivos reptiles, when we seize them? These were illegal, uh, but very difficult to deal with these shipments uh, of live wildlife that come in. Uh, tenemos merque, muchos mercados de elementos étnicos yeah? uh, in Estados Unidos. Uh, in, in the United States, we have a very diverse ethnic population, much like Brazil. And we have many ethnic markets. And this is just one of them in Boston, uh, Chinatown, where they're selling some illegal uh, turtles and achievos, uh, native turtles and some illegal fish. Uh, native fish here in the United States is just one example. So Chinatown, yeah? uh, ethnical, uh, Mercado ethnical in Boston, in Nueva York, uh, Ch Chinese, huh? China, Chinese. Uh, as you can see, this is just uh, one market, un mercado, uh, called Medicinas de Chinese, uh, China's, China medicine. And you can see in the background the pictures of wildlife on the packaging. So there's a lot of, of uh, medicinas here with endangered wildlife, such as pangolins, alligators, rhino, tiger, uh, many, muito species uh, endangered uh, involved in this medicinal trade. It's just a closer picture. You can see some of the species, the species in these uh, estas and medicinas. Uh, shark fin, yeah, uh, tiburon, um, uh, muito uh, expensive, very, very expensive. And this is an issue in the, in the United States, in Brazil's share, is the illegal trade in shark fins. Uh, there's a delicacy, delicado, del delicado in uh, China in Asian culture to eat sharks and shark fin for soup. And you can see some of the value uh, here in US dollars per pound, um, less than a kilo. Huh? That's a lot of money. Uh, we also deal with muito contrabando, uh, contrabando uh, across the border, a frontera, uh, dos Estados Unidos, um, uh, con Mexico. Huh? Mexico y también Canada. Uh, 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 they drive across in cars. Uh, this is a picture of wildlife smuggled in the wheel well of a vehicle, much like you would smuggle cocaine or drogos uh, or other illegal commodities. We also see uh, pessoas, uh, contrabando, uh, vida silvestre on their person, right, on, on their body. Uh, I'll strap them to their legs. Uh, they smuggle them in their suitcases and socks and boots and packaging. Uh, as you can see here, all these turtles smuggled in cereal boxes and socks. Um, so this is a shipment, uh, uh, Barbatanas, Barbatanas de Tiburon, huh? 
manifestam erroneamente como pepinos. Uh, they, they manifested these as, uh, as cucumbers. Uh, open the container and it's full of illegal shark fins. And the reason why they would smuggle the shark fins this way is because typical, typical Manchi, um, most agencies wouldn't care much about pickles or um, uh, it's not a concern, right? So they label it something that no agency will want to buscar, will want to look at because uh, who cares about cucumbers, right? So this is typical, typical Manchi, how they contraband uh, the smuggle. Um, this is an example from uh, do Brazil. Huh? Uh, muito um, uh, barbatanas de tiburão uh, in Belém. Ibama uh, apprehensões, mas uh, todos, uh, these were all on their way to China. And I think, uh, although this was a um, great case with Ibama and great seizure, apprehensões, mas uh, I think, I should say, that they missed an opportunity. Uh, they missed an opportunity here uh, because these were all being not going to Brazil. They were being exported to China. And so what's very important here is that we need to work together um, on these investigations. Where were these going? Uh, who were the Chinese business that were going to buy these fins? Uh, could we work with the Chinese government uh, to do a transnational investigation? to shut down the factory in China, and at the same time, shut down and investigate the Brazilian empresa, huh? the Brazilian Brazilian empresa brasileira. Because it's very important, because after they made this seizure of shark fins, that empresa in China is just going to buy more shark fins. They didn't get their, their sechi tunadas de ba Barbatanas, they did their own. They didn't get their seven tons of shark fin. So what are they going to do? China is going to find another seven tons of shark fin from another country or from another shipper in Brazil. So that's why it's very important that we work together on transnational cases. Otro example, uh, ovos de tar tartaruga, uh, uh, sea turtle, marinho, uh, uh, contrabandeando sin bagagem post especial. Uh, uh, this lady is not very happy. You can see she's lost all her sea turtle eggs. Uh, in uh, Central American uh, cultures, many, uh, they believe these are an aphrodisiac, yeah? like, uh, like Viagra, Viagra, yeah? uh, Medicina Viagra. <laughs> uh, então, uh, they smuggle them. They're appendix one, illegal. And they smuggle them in baggage and bring them in. And uh, if you go to many um, uh, El Salvadorian bars in Estados Unidos, uh, if, you're, uh, uh, if you look Hispanic, Hispanic, or if you're Hispanic, you can go into some of these bars and ask for a sea turtle egg. And they'll, they'll sell you one. And so uh, we have many investigations in Estados Unidos uh, on this very issue because a lot of these uh, endangered sea turtle eggs are smuggled into the United States this way. Uh, in personal baggage. Now, this particular woman is uh, what you'd call like a drug mule, a um, drug mule, yeah? So she doesn't have anything to do with this trade. She is carrying this illegal contraband to the United States for payment. And what she explained is that she was going to get paid the amount that covered her plane ticket for her to go back and see her mother in El Salvador, right? So her humping these illegal sea turtle eggs got her enough money so she can travel back to El Salvador to see her family. So sometimes uh, in this situation, uh, this isn't the real smuggler, right? That's just someone who's doing it uh, for a plane ticket. Um, this is an example of a case uh, I had in Arizona, uh, Un Cazador. Um, uh, Casado y ligamente no México y en tal importados de los Estados Unidos. So he paid 76,000 US dollars to go on this illegal hunt in Mexico. And they uh, doctored up the 
the paperwork, uh, made it look legal, and then he imported this trophy into the United States. And so this investigation revealed that, uh, in fact, the permits and the hunt were illegal and false, and we seized this trophy. But this shows you the value uh, that just a single trophy for some of these uh, uh, very highly endangered species will fetch. So this hunter paid that much money to hunt that particular animal on a very specific island in, the, um, in, in Mexico where that was renowned for the largest sheep. So this hunter wanted to have the largest sheep trophy that he could get, and he paid that much money just to hunt on this uh, illegally on this island. Um, so uh, that gives you an idea. Uh, uh, there's a um, otro example, uh, Shifri de Genesaranchi, y also uh, de Tigre, Hemegios Tradicionales Chinese, Contrabandianos no Foro Inferior da Mala. Uh, this was uh, a grandmother, a little old lady, she was a nice lady, and she didn't, uh, uh, you wouldn't think she'd ever do anything wrong. Uh, but here, sewed, sewed into the bottom of her suitcase are these illegal medicines made from tiger and rhino horn, uh, sewed into the bottom of her suitcase, uh, much like you would do with uh, bricks of cocaine or drugs. Yeah? So incredible length people will go to, to smuggle wildlife, um, the same as drugs or any other illegal commodity. You know? um, this is a um, uh, recurring, mucho uh, problema in Estados Unidos, um, do, uh, da Amazona. Yeah? Uh, estes aves, um, these came from um, uh, Venezuela, okay. no, no Brazil. Mas, uh, species Amazonas. Yeah? Aves vivas, tranquilizadas, uh, y contrabandias in model. I can't read this, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, but these, we, these birds were tranquilized and smuggled into hair curlers. Huh? Modelo Doris de Cabello. And then uh, smuggled into New York, JFK airport, Airpuerto. Um, and this is recurring, this happens uh, between six and 12 times per year, just in the New York airport alone. Uh, so these are little songbirds um, that are protected and they're uh, prohibited from being imported to the United States. So the only way you can bring them in is to smuggle them in a manner like this. Um, most of these birds died in transit. And the ones that didn't die, uh, we had to euthanize them uh, because of we had concerns about disease and these birds being diseased to our native birds in the United States. So all of these birds uh, die uh, if they don't make it through this smuggling capacity. Uh, here's an example of a statues falsus. Huh? We deal with this a lot in the United States. Uh, Archi Africana, huh? manifestados como Archi Africana, marfim, contrabando de elefante in, in dentro. Huh? So uh, this marfim, illegal elephant ivory, illegal to import to the United States, they smuggle it inside wood art statues very craftfully. Um, and this particular shipment, we would have never found it, uh, except for this story, uh, a forklift in the warehouse of the airline uh, went around the corner a little too fast and hit one of these boxes full of wooden art from Africa. And when it hit it, it hit a wood statue and ivory spilled out all over the floor in the American Airlines warehouse. <laughs> and so when that happened, uh, we were called, obviously, and we found all of this smuggled ivory uh, stuffed into these statues uh, in this large and very messy and difficult to inspect African art shipment. Uh, we have muchos ejemplos de tráfico de animales salvajes nativos de los Estados Unidos. Uh, algunos ejemplos, uh, exportación de pele de jacaré americano. Uh, so this is an uh, American alligator. Um, Jacarés casados no estado de Louisiana. Illegamente. Illegamente. Eh? Marcado falsamente com as uh, uh, sentidos. Um, uh, como se diz tags? Um, etiquetas? 
de Cites da Estado, Estado de Florida. Uh, ex, uh, exportation para Italia. Uh, violations de lei lazy e também violations de Cites. Uh, so these were legally hunted in Louisiana. They brought them to Florida and tried to tag them with illegal tags saying you're from a different state. And we caught them in this instance. Uh, shark fins, this is a uh, problema in Estados Unidos e Brazil. Uh, in Estados Unidos e Brazil, uh, we uh, no, no comer uh, babatadas uh, de tiburão in Estados Unidos, no Brazil, mas uh, they do in China, right? So there's a lot of illegal fishing and trade in shark, and all of these commodities are exported from both Brazil e Estados Unidos, uh, primarily, primarily para China. Uh? Um, each one of the shipments in this uh, this particular case, uh, uma queso, um queso, um, uh, this shipper from Florida export this amount every single week, and he would ship export on the weekend when he knew uh, the inspectors were not working. He would drop off these pallets of shark fins for export to Hong Kong. Each one of these shipments was valued at 100,000 US dollars. They were worth five times that amount in Hong Kong. So the Hong Kong uh, importers would sell them for approximately $500,000. So there's a lot of value in this illegal trade for both illegal fishermen, the exporters, the importers, and the ultimate uh, commodity, which here you can see a bowl of shark fin soup in China that can sell up to $100 US dollars just for a single bowl of shark fin soup. So along the value chain, there's a lot of people making a lot of illegal funds. Uh, we deal with a lot of heptais nativos, illegal in the Estados Unidos. We have muito uh, unicos, uh, we have many unique uh, heptais in Estados Unidos, especially in the Southwest where I worked in Arizona. I worked with many poachers, uh, poaching illegal heptais in uh, Arizona and shipping them to Europa, primarily. Yeah? Uh, um example, yeah? uh, a species nativo in the Estados Unidos. Uh, so uh, a U.S. collector, um, can get this amount, uh, these amounts for their, their turtles in the United States. And uh, they sell, just single turtles, uh, sell for thousands of dollars. Uh, and this particular species of turtle can sell up to $15,000 for one turtle. Uh, so it's incredible amount of value in these. Uh, we deal a lot with caviar. So, um, paddlefish americana, caviar, yeah? Uh, so in Russia, Iran, many of these other uh, paises, ultra paises, uh, they've outfished all of their sturgeon caviar. So there's no more fish. So we have literally Russian mafia running around the Midwest United States, buying illegal sturgeon and paddlefish caviar from fishermen along the Mississippi watershed. So this is uh, organized crime. Uh, involved in this illegal wildlife trade, okay. even in the United States, uh, so they can export these back out uh, to Western, um, Eastern Europe. Uh, also, uh, we have uh, un problem, un problem con uh, peces de do orso. Huh? Um, so the gallbladders and the paws uh, of bears are bears are being killed and poached, like this bear in Tennessee you can see has been killed and its gallbladder has been cut out. It was killed strictly just for its gallbladder. Uh, and to the right is a picture of uh, bear paws that were seized in China. Um, we don't know what bear sales came from, but uh, the, the paws are uh, wanted as a delicacy in some Asian cultures. And the gallbladder from bears, from all species, uh, totals of species de orsos, 
is, uh, is used for medicinal purposes, for tra traditional Chinese medicine. Uh, this is from one of my cases in Arizona, uh, Estado de Arizona, um, American Bobcat. Uh, I don't know how to say it in Portuguese, but uh, uh, we do um, uh, Janeiro para pele uh, de Bobcat. Yeah? So this is the last spotted cat uh, that has a legal trade. This is Appendix 2 in CITES. So it's actually allowed when this animal is legally hunted uh, or farmed. However, we have a lot of poaching and illegal activity in the United States, and they try to pass this, these, these skins off as legal and then export them to Russia and China primarily, uh, where they can get up to a thousand US dollars per skin. And so uh, the case, or case in Estados Unidos in Arizona, was uh, a hunter who was killing these animals on indigenous, indigenous. Indigenous lands uh, illegally, and this animal is actually a sacred animal to this particular tribe. He was killing them illegal on, on their tribal lands, and then claiming they were from a different place uh, or hunted legally when, in fact, they weren't. Uh, we have a big problem with uh, Drafico de Marfim mammifera, marino, uh, marine mammals, uh, in particular walrus and whales in Estados Unidos. Because uh, Bocasa e Marfim de Elefanti is so rare, is, uh, is, is this, this so little elephant ivory out there, uh, that they're actually uh, uh, collecting a lot more ivory from marine mammals. So we're seeing a lot of poaching of uh, marine mammals for their ivory now because of the lack of availability of elephant ivory. And this is a case involving uh, marine mammal ivory illegally shipped from Alaska to the Estado de Hawaii, Hawaii. Uh, and they're selling them in Hawaii, trying to claim them as legal. But in fact, they were from illegal animals from Alaska. Um, this is just a blatant case of uh, another type of marine mammal ivory. This is called a narwhal a whale, a very uh, unique whale that has a horn, uh, a tusk, uh, that is very unique. And uh, many people think it's mystical, uh, like a unicorn horn almost. It's very mystical, mystique. And uh, this was a truck that was smuggling these horns under their truck uh, coming from uh, Canada uh, into the United States uh, that was investigated and prosecuted for three years in prison. Uh, we also deal with uh, a lot of illegal trade of totuaba, which is a species de pache in Mexico. Uh, it's very endangered. And uh, again, is considered a delicacy in uh, China uh, in some Asian cultures. And what they want from this fish is not the meat, but the swim bladder. Uh, specificado, a swim bladder from this, this very endangered fish, uh, supposedly has special powers in the Asian culture. They, it's a delicacy. And so, in Tao, uh, we see this fish, swim bladder, being smuggled like drugs over the Mexican border into the Estados Unidos, where it's export de soing uh, para China, uh, uh, from Los Angeles y otros uh, cidades de California. Um, so we've had muitos uh, prosecutions, uh, many prosecutions in California for this activity. And it's uh, organized Chinese uh, criminals. Uh, that are engaged in this trafficking activity worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. So, for example, uh, the value uh, for this illegal trade. If you see the value here, uh, 1500 US dollars for the uh, Chiega Paga Os Pescadores Locais. locais eh? So, for the local fishermen, Pescadores Locais, $1,500. For Bechega Paga o Comprador Local, for the local buyer, uh, 5,000 US dollars for one single bladder for this fish. And for the preso final de venda in China, uh, 10,000 to 20,000 US dollars for one single swim bladder. So you can see again the illegal uh, nature of this trade. 
and uh, you know the, the the value that that every stage of this illegal trade that people are extracting. Um, I'm not sure if I can uh, say this, but this is a case of uh, uh, Euro. Um, this is a uh, numero uh, uno problema com o crime de recurso cultural. So this is the number one natural resource crime in Europe right now. And Europol is very, very engaged in this. But it's, it's eels. It's European eels uh, that are being trafficked by illegal fishermen. And these eels are all being exported to China. And the way that they, uh, that they smuggle these eels, they're baby eels, uh, and they smuggle them out of Europe because they're completely illegal to harvest or have or ship or sell. But they organize crime in Europe is collecting the eels from the wild and illegally smuggling them to China. And the way that they do this is, again, through drug mule people who ship these in their suitcases to Hong Kong and China. And I get a very quick video with that in mind. If you think about the trafficking of these endangered eels from Europe to Asia in suitcases, I want to show you a very short video, if I can, uh, that is, uh, and here's some pictures of the eels being smuggled in suitcases, okay? With that in mind, I want you to watch this very short video to give you some perspective. And this video is from Guardia Civil in España, in Spain. So this is their Spanish federal police. Can you see that video, guys? Can you hear this? Can you see that? Yes, we can see. Okay. This is no sound. It's no sound. But you don't need sound to see what's going on here. This is the federal police um, with a federal search warrant for the business in Spain, in present day España. Remember, these eels are illegal to possess or fish. And you can see all the tanks of illegal eels. And there they are. You see baby eels. Now, this is a warehouse in Spain. And remember what I said about the motive, opera operandi, modus operandi de contrabando, huh? They smuggle these out in suitcases. There are 360 brand new suitcases against the far wall of this warehouse. So this gives you an idea, and of course, seizure of cash, 37 million euros worth of illegal eels were seized that day. And uh, luckily, uh, they were able to repatriate some back to the rivers in Spain, get them back into the wild where they belong, which is a good happy ending here. But if you think of that modus operandi of how they smuggle those out, and you see that wall of brand new suitcases against the wall, that gives you some perspective about the nature of transnational organized crime engaged in all forms of wildlife trafficking. So, uh, you know, this just gives you a little bit of an idea, and I just thought that was instructive just to, to watch the video. I'm going to get out of that and finish my presentation here for us all. So this is them releasing some of these, uh, some of these eels back to the wild, which is a good thing. Right. Right. Hmm? Are we back to the presentation? Brian, we're a little bit over time here. Uh, so okay. I don't know if you would like to take some questions okay. still, but or if you prefer to finish. Yeah, just give me a few minutes. I'll finish up here. So this is, again, where these eels end up in China. They grow the eels out. They sell them in the illegal trade. And then they export these illegal eels all over the world for primarily the Japanese sushi trade. So most of them are share exported to Japan. But of course, the United States eats a lot of sushi as well. And so we see these eels come back in a frozen form uh, back to the United States after they were smuggled out of Europe. So again, this is a global problem. So France and Spain are fighting the on the ground poaching of these species in their country. Then they're smuggled to China. China is then exporting them all over the world. And as you can see from this simple map, this is a global problem. This is a global issue. 
And again, this, is, this species is listed in CITES. So this species falls under that international treaty that we are supposed to be working together on these, on these issues. So this is a great example of a protected species internationally and how we can work together um, in illegal trade. So this is myself and one of our inspectors in Los Angeles inspecting one of these shipments of eel from China. And we end up seizing this entire shipment. You can see this container of eel was emptied out. You can see all the boxes in blue and red. And uh, we found that these were these illegal eels from Europe and uh, we seized this entire shipment. And here is the Chinese document falsely manifesting the species as Japanese eel. when in fact, it was that illegal European eel smuggled out of Europe. And this is just a graphic of uh, the uh, values of, we see end up seizing 20 containers with 23 million US dollars in one month at the port of New York and Los Angeles of these illegal eel from China. That again, all stemmed from species smuggled from Europe. Uh, another example, uh, Interpol and other international agencies do international operations. Um, one here, this gives you an example. Um, we had 109 Paises participate in this operation and we seized a lot of commodities and uh, arrested a lot of people and worked together as countries to counter wildlife trafficking. And just here's a few pictures. Uh, here's one from Chile, uh, some birds they seized. And uh, the picture on the right is from Mexico during this particular operation. There's some more turtles uh, they seized in Mexico during the operation. Uh, this is a picture from China. I'm not sure what this guy did, but he, he's obviously in trouble. Not a fishing vessel there in China. They submitted that picture. Uh, this is a picture from Estados Unidos during the course of the Operation Sling. Um, this is uh, 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 1,700 uh, endangered sea turtle shells that we see is coming from the uh, island of Haiti. And the picture on your right, the inspector is holding up one of these sea turtle shells, and that's a bullet hole uh, through one of these sea turtle shell scoots. Uh, so they're actively sh shooting, hunting, illegally killing these sea turtles uh, for this illegal trade. And these are just shells going to Vietnam uh, for the Chinese medicinal trade. Uh, we engage with the private sector, uh, civil society, yeah? uh, 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 NGOs routinely uh, on this issue. So it's not just a law enforcement issue, but we also work with industry. Um, this was uh, illegal walrus ivory that one of our um, big retailers in Estados Unidos uh, was selling illegal walrus ivory on their website. And uh, sometimes they, they don't even know it's illegal. And we had to go visit this, uh, this business and tell them, look, you can't sell that stuff on your website. They took it down, they got a fine. Um, but, you know, even most prominent companies sometimes are dealing in illegal wildlife, uh, even if unknown to them. Um, we also deal with a lot of social media is a huge problem with the trafficking of wildlife on Facebook, WhatsApp, eBay. Uh, this is the biggest thing that we deal with in trafficking of wildlife now is on social media. Because muitos veces, if you're not in these specific groups, if you're not engaged in these groups, you don't even know what's going on. So you have to be, uh, we have many undercover agents working on social media and Facebook that are engaging these groups and sh seeing how they're being illegally sold and traded and investigating those groups. But it's way too diff diff uh, very, very difficult, uh, especially when these groups are operating out of China, right? So these are U.S. endangered species being actively traded on, um, on, on Chinese social media sites. How they got to the China, we have no idea. They shouldn't be there. just a schematic of uh, this, the syndicate, the smugglers, uh, the suppliers. This is kind of what I've been talking about throughout my presentation. Um, so um, real quickly, I'm here in Brazil now. Uh, we have attaches in different spots all over the world. And our job, uh, U.S. Uh, GIDOs, our job is to work with these governments and these countries to counter wildlife trafficking.
We do uh, mucho treinamiento uh, in uh, many uh, areas, including forenses, uh, técnicas de investigación, uh, fonches y informantes, inform informants, investigación secretas y crimes cybernético uh, y otros. Uh, um, un ejemplo, uh, caso conjunto con Policía Federal y Obama, Uh, Operación Kibifish, uh, contrabando de peces nativos en extinción del Brasil para Estados Unidos y Europa también. Uh, Agido dos Estados Unidos, uh, juntase a Madeiros de Busca, no Brasil y Agido de Policía Federal uh, en Washington, D.C. Uh, Participante en entrevistas en Estados Unidos. Um, violaciones criminales. Uh, comprobadas no Brazil y no Estados Unidos. So again, an important aspect is that uh, Brazilians smuggling illegal and dangerous wildlife to the United States. Uh, our engagement, we can now investigate uh, suspectos in Estados Unidos. Yeah, muy importante. Uh, y también uh, tráfico de madera um, uh, do Brazil. Uh, Estados Unidos. And so we uh, import uh, a lot of timber from the Amazon in Estados Unidos. Uh, it's very difficult to see if this timber is actually legal or illegal, but uh, through my working with IBAMA and Otro Agencias uh, in Brazil, um, we're able to better coordinate and better determine where this timber actually came from. Because as you can imagine, we deal with muito falsos documentos We deal with a lot of document fraud. We see documents in the United States that make the timber look legal. But when I work with uh, authorities do, do Brazil, we find out and, uh, they're fraud, right? Uh, or the shipment is illegal. And so it's very important that we work on this. And in the past, ano, uh, ano passado, uh, in the South Unidos, apprehend sewing uh, 15 uh, remesas de Madeira, do Uh, Brazil, from Brazil, that were illegal. So in the past year, we've seized 14 shipments uh, from Brazil that were illegal that we would have never known unless we worked with Brazilian authorities. Uh, and so, uh, mail email, uh, aquí, uh, if you have um, cualquier preguntas, uh, you can email me, uh, but I'd be happy to take any questions now if there's time. Um, I probably, probably mention, uh, Preciso some help, ajudar com trans translation, uh, if that's possible. So uh, if there's time for any questions, I'm, I'm happy to take them. Wow, Brian, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Uh, this was amazing. Muito obrigado, Brian, pela apresentação. Eu estou com um pouco de delay na internet, então alguns de vocês estão escutando um pouco de eco, mas a gente vai tentar superar isso. É os desafios da vida da pós-pandemia. Uh, eu vou fazer em português e a gente traduz conforme for fazendo a pergunta. Lembrando que essa parte das perguntas e respostas a gente faz em inglês, mas depois vai ter a tradução no vídeo do YouTube para vocês acompanharem. Uh, Brian, so I'm going to make most of the questions in Portuguese, in English, and then we can translate them later, so uh, might be easier uh, for, for people to follow. Yeah. Uh, it's incredible to see all the information in wildlife trafficking. Uh, every day we hear more about, I think, as... Uh, citizens, as lovers of nature, we get more frustrated. Uh, and it seems to me a lot of uh, wildlife trafficking is, is really related to any sort of trafficking, like uh, the way you're showing how people usually smuggle things across the board will be a lot like drugs, any other kind of uh, illegal uh, things. So what would you say to our audience that's 
thinking about creating a solution for wild trafficking this weekend that is maybe a particular thing that they should consider when thinking about how to disable organizations which is one of our challenges or even uh, how to support um, agencies like yourself to figure out better ways to combat wildlife trafficking yeah, so um, my presentation, I showed several examples of some of the challenges that we face, right? So if you remember the picture of all the hep dice in all those sealed boxes in one shipment uh, in Miami, right? So Miami Port deals about with, you know, half a dozen, six shipments like that every single day. They can't look at everything, right? So it's very easy to hide smuggled wildlife within quote unquote legal shipments. And also very difficult to detect. If you think about, uh, 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 think about the port, Porto de Santos in Sao Paulo, right? Biggest seaport in South America. If you went to that port, you would see an ocean of ocean containers, just thousands and thousands of ocean containers. The challenge is, which one of those containers has illegal wildlife? How do we target that? How do we detect that? If the shark fins are manifested as pickles or cucumbers, right? How do we detect that? How do we determine that? How do we pick that out out of thousands of ocean containers that actually may contain pickles <laughs> or cucumbers, right? So it, it, there's a lot of challenges in the manner in which wildlife is smuggled. And I often say that uh, we only catch a very small proportion, right? When you catch something, you think, how many have I missed, right? How many exports of cucumbers have gone out that were full of shark fins that we didn't see before? So uh, identifying, targeting illegal wildlife that's shipped this way is very, very challenging. So solutions uh, to that, um, we do have some x-ray technology that sometimes helps us show that the commodity is incorrect inside the container, but that technology has not improved a whole lot in, in recent years, and um, it's hard to determine, for instance, if it's shark fins or pickles in a container, right? So uh, x-ray sometimes helps, but maybe not. Um, so perhaps technical solutions. Um, but uh, there was some good examples in my presentation of what we find by almost by accident and the challenges we face in detecting that type of activity. Because as soon as we determine they're shipping, uh, they're smuggling shark fins out as cucumbers, when we figure that out, the bad guys know that, now they find a new manner, yeah? a new way of doing it. And so we're all, always trying to keep up with the contrabando, with the, with the smugglers. Awesome. A gente vai responder agora uma pergunta da plateia. Ah, o Larry pergunta. Ai, obrigada pela tua pergunta, Larry. Larry. Um, what kind do you think? Uh, what do you think about technologies as a tool to control the international traffic of animals? Yeah, I mean that is um, that is muito importante. Yeah, that, that's very important for us. Um, like I said, we normally just luck out and catch something, right? Uh, but for us to, uh, you know. We don't, like the other issue is social media. We don't know what's going on in some of these social media sites. Uh, there's a Grupo de Heptais, yeah? Uh, dois, dois mil uh, participantes, yeah? So we have 2,000 participants in this one Facebook group on reptiles. And on that group, they're trading, selling, uh, illegally shipping things, and no one knows about that unless someone outside the group is told about it, right? Or is able to join covertly or something like that. Uh, so there's a lot of opportunities in social media uh, to perhaps mine out this data 
to find out, you know, where these illegal animals are being sell, sold on social media and to be able to uh, mine that out and perhaps alert authorities so that they can intercede, right? But unless we're ever not told, we don't, we don't know what's going on. And like I said, x-ray technology is, is very important. Um, perhaps uh, technology to monitor and go through documentation. Um, so the shark fin example. Shark fins, the paperwork says cucumbers, right? Paperwork says cucumbers. If, if We just got lucky and found it. But if we had uh, a system, a system that could look at the paperwork and make sure that things match up, you know, uh, maybe the weights aren't matching up. Maybe the description is different somewhere else. Uh, something is not quite right. A system that would alert us to inconsistencies that might point to a mismanifest or a smuggling activity. So maybe they called it cucumbers on one paperwork and somewhere else they called it something else. Or maybe they didn't align the quantities, right? Because they're falsifying everything. So if there was a system, a technology that could help us sift through this paperwork and pick out inconsistencies and flag it perhaps as a, a shipment of interest, right? Something that we take a closer look at. Because literally there are hundreds of thousands to millions of shipments coming into the United States and Brazil being imported and exported every day. And authorities can't look at everything. One estimate is that customs in the United States looks at about 5% of imports into the United States. So there is a lot of shipments, for instance, that are being missed, right? And I would assume that Brazil is probably around the same way. Customs can't look. Uh, if you ever visited the Porto de Santos in, in Sao Paulo, you would see um, there's limited customs authorities. They can only look at a certain amount of shipments. And to look through that sea of ocean containers, for example, and just have a system to go through the manifestation and maybe pick up man uh, 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 inconsistencies that maybe those shipments deserve a closer look or may contain this or whatever. Uh, but it's, it's, winter deficit. It's, a, it's a very difficult problem. Uh, but technology is extremely, extremely important. And the other um, uh, great thing that's happening with technology right now is in isotope analysis. So isotope analysis is when we have a species of plant or animal, uh, many times, uh, give an example in Brazil, you have a uh, beautiful wood here, ipe. Yeah, you're familiar with ipe? It's a beautiful tree. And the hardwood from ipe species in Brazil is very um, in demand in the Estados Unidos. It makes a beautiful flooring, pisos. Pisos lindas, yeah? Um, very nice flooring. We import a lot from uh, Brazil. Now, the paperwork says it came from this private ranch, okay? But we suspect it may have come from a national park or indigenous lands, right? That isotope analysis can not only provide the species of ipe it is, but that but the isotope analysis can also say uh, where it came from, the origin of the tree. So it picks up on the soil and water quality in the area where the tree or wildlife is eating or growing, and it can allocate a general area in which it occurred or originated. And that is very important. That's a developing technology right now. That's gonna be very important for our work in determining true origin of timber and wildlife. Uh, the Piruruku fish, another fish that's fished throughout the Amazon, both legally and illegally in different areas. And so when we get a shipment of Piruruku meat in the Estados Unidos or pelos, peles, skins, yeah. Last year, we imported 17,000 skins from Peruku fish, which is amazing. It's just the full skins of these fish for leather. They say it came from a legal fishery in a certain part of the Amazon. But if we could do isotope analysis on that skin or that meat and determine it came from an illegal area, then we can start an investigation with Brazil and fight that criminal element. Because many times, uh, we're dealing with 
wildlife trade that has a legal nexus and an illegal nexus. That's the challenge. Because with wildlife, it's not like cocaine. Cocaine is illegal, right? Cocaine's illegal. But your reptile uh, or ipe wood could be perfectly legal or it could be perfectly illegal, all depending on the circumstances, where you harvested it, where it came from. So the circumstances surrounding the wildlife, Madeira, Plantas, indicates whether it's legal or illegal. It's different, differentiate de cocaine, yeah? Drogos, drogos are illegal, it's easy. Fácil, mais fácil. Tráfico de vida salvaje es muy difícil, yeah? Because it's always that combinar, como legal y illegal, yeah? So, uh, and Ipe, a board, Madeira de Ipe, can be, when it arrives in the US, it could be legal, or it could be completely illegal, depending on the circumstances. Very interesting, this uh, extra challenge we have with wildlife that not everybody might be aware of it. Uh, and we do see a few uh, blockchain technology companies trying to make sure they track uh, and they certify where this is coming from. Uh, in uh, it is it is a lot of technologies being used to also help that. So we're gonna have a lot of mentors through the weekend. They are from also technology uh, side uh, to also bring this richness of uh, of discussion of what are already solutions, but most solutions are still in a prototype or like development phase, and then uh, it's really hard to get them into. Uh, mass production or uh, scale, right? So it actually solves it. But you guys are going to hear a few examples through the week. Um, Brian, uh, we are going to take one more question from the public. Uh, are you okay with time? Uh, can we go uh, a few more minutes? Yeah, I'm fine. I just felt that I went over a little bit, but um, I got oh. plenty of time. Much you need. So, uh, uh, Ana Carolina says this was a great presentation. Uh, it changed it, it showed a little bit of the perspectives of how uh, you work uh, uh, enforcing law. Uh, I would like to know uh, what are preventive activities you guys do as well, not just enforcing law, but what are some um, preventive activities uh, the US government is doing? Yeah, uh, I can I can actually read that. I can read better than I can I can talk. <laughs> uh, but I, I I get the question. Um, so you know, obviously, my small aspect of this, my office of law enforcement, we do fiscal uh, as Yeah, we do the enforcement side of it. But equally, or perhaps even more important, is a lot of the work that um, some of my colleagues are doing in demand reduction. So I'll give you a poor example. Um, one NGO in China uh, had spent uh, quite a few millions of dollars in a campaign in China uh, to stop people from um, eating shark fin. And they got uh, Chinese uh, uh, stars, right? The famous people in China on their billboards uh, talking about don't eat China, you know, shark fin soup and all this. They did a fantastic media campaign to really bring out the issue. what Because Chinese culture, if you serve shark fin soup, it's an honor, it's it's a big thing. You have a guest and you serve them shark fin soup, that's a huge honor, honor right? So it's more of a cultural thing, like it's you're, you're rich and you can honor someone by serving them shark fin soup. And they, they really did a fantastic, uh, and I can't remember the, the NGO right now, but they did a fantastic campaign in China to dissuade people from serving shark fin soup. And then they did a lobbying effort with the Chinese government. And they were successful in actually getting the Chinese government to come out and say that we will no longer be serving shark fin soup at any government functions. It's completely prohibited. And that was a huge statement from the Chinese government and it had a big effect on the Chinese culture that, oh, maybe this isn't such a, uh, 
an honorary thing. Maybe this isn't such a wonderful thing. It really changed perceptions. And since that time, uh, we really have seen a decline in the demand for shark. Uh, but we're still seeing a lot of illegal trade uh, because the shark that's actually out there is being basically blatantly smuggled because more shark species have since become protected under CITES. Uh, several years ago, many sharks were not covered, were not protected under CITES. Recent conferences, they protected the species. So now more species are protected, so there's a lot more blatant smuggling going on. But they did reduce the demand, and that is equally as important to the work that we do. So we try to do the enforcement. You get in trouble, so don't do this, right? But the demand reduction side by NGOs and our partners out there, they put out the message and really tried to change perceptions, change attitudes, right? Uh, so um, that, that's a very, very important aspect. And I know our own government's doing a lot of that. And right now the work we're doing with timber is we're really scrutinizing timber shipments when they arrive at US ports from Brazil. And we're making sure everything is just right. And if it's not just right, we dig deeper and then we find more problems and things like that. And so we're putting a lot of the Brazilian shippers on notice uh, that you better make sure that the shipment's perfect because we're looking at the paperwork, we're asking questions, and it better be right, or we're gonna seize that timber in the US, or worse, launch an investigation on both the US and Brazilian side. So this work is very, very important. Um, it's, it's really changing the nature of how the exporters do business where now they're making sure that their paperwork is just right. They're making sure that they're only shipping illegal timber to the US because we don't want to be a conduit to deforestation in the Amazon. We don't want to be a conduit to illegal trade from Brazil. So it's a partnership. Uh, so again, there's different aspects, uh, but we're all doing, um, doing these things to counter this illegal trade. Hope that answers the question. Uh, Brian, you mentioned a lot about the, the government work uh, that you guys do uh, with other governments uh, and then also with nonprofits. You just, you just mentioned uh, in China. Um, but I, I was wondering right now, um, how about the private sector? Like we hear a lot about the private sector being the one that buys the illegal uh, trafficking. But do you see in the this past decade you have been working, do you see a trend of uh, the private sector being more wet? And how do you see the private sector plays in this uh, illegal trading as well? Yeah, that's, that's very important. I mean, a lot of what we deal with are, um, for instance, we, we seize a lot of illegal wildlife. So I'll give you an example. Uh, there's, there's a company I worked with in Atlanta, Georgia, when I worked there, and I was an inspector. And this company imported tropical fish and live coral for it. And they brought in 10 shipments every single week, hundreds of boxes of live fish and coral. And I would work with them uh, as they brought shipments in, we clear their shipments for legal ones. Um, and, you know, once in a while there'd be a legal shipment. So they would get a thousand illegal coral, for instance, live coral from Indonesia. And the paperwork's not right. Turns out it's completely illegal. Um, we would seize the coral. We'd find the company. But then we continue working with the Impreza, working with the company, because they can put pressure on their seller in Indonesia to ensure that they never ship illegal coral again and tell them, look, I'm not gonna buy from you ever again if you're gonna be shipping the illegal coral. You better have this permit, you better have this, you better make sure it's legal. So it's, it's almost a partnership, even though you're finding them sometimes, and there are some people that are just bad and they smuggle and they do bad things. But many of these companies are trying to do the right thing and sometimes, um, sometimes they get a bad shipment or illegal. And if you work with them, you can use their buying power to actually impact the illegal shipper in the other country, right? So after that seizure of a thousand coral from Indonesia, our company in Atlanta said, "We're not going to buy any more coral from you unless it's, you know unless you get everything together and it's perfectly legal and everything else." And then there was never a problem with that company again. 
So it's, it's a partnership. And then as well, um, working with NGOs, there's a lot of NGOs doing a lot of good work, including here in Brazil. Um, I work with one of them, you'll hear from her later this week, Juliana from Freeland, and she's incredibly knowledgeable and um, she has uh, great expertise. You know why? Because she's lived here her whole life. She's worked in this realm her whole life and she's much smarter than I am, okay? <laughs> so I've been here a year and a half. I'm still learning Brazilian culture. I'm still learning uh, the things that happen here. Uh, but I'm very knowledgeable, of course, uh, on the U.S. side. So there's a lot I can do to collaborate. Um, but NGOs have a lot that they can offer, a lot of expertise, a lot of insight um, that sometimes government don't have, right? Because NGOs are working with people on the ground and sometimes with communities and with uh, these businesses where we're just the government and, you know, we're wrapped up in our own world. So uh, it's very important to work across civil society and the private sector uh, on, on these issues. Uh, and I'm going to wrap it up with one more question from Lucas, really direct one, uh, just because I think just pop up here and it's really important. Is there any kind of system control that about uh, white wing countries? Uh, you shared that link with us earlier. Is that a place we can go or do you have any other resources? Um, well, yeah, there is a, um, so uh, we talked about CITES, the International Treaty. And again, almost every country in the world is party to CITES. And one of the requirements of CITES, one thing that every country has to abide by is reporting, annual reporting. So every single year, Brazil and the United States and every other party, even though some don't do it, then they get in trouble. But every country is supposed to report annually all of their trade and CITES wildlife. So it does not include all wildlife, but it includes a lot of protected wildlife, right? So you can go on the website, CITES.org, and I'll type it in here. Um, you can go on the website, CITES.org, and that website, you can actually uh, go in and review the reports from Brazil of everything that was traded in the last year. So you could pick a year, and, and look at, and you can pick specific species like Pararuku, right? Or Jacare, uh, or any other species, or just all of them. And uh, see what Brazil has reported annually uh, to the CITES Secretariat in Switzerland uh, on trade. And you can do that for every single country. And this is a very, uh, it's, a, it's publicly accessible, and it can, you can kind of really get a great idea of the global trade and many species and for instance, I can go in and see uh, how much CITES wildlife Brazil exported to the United States last year. I can do that right now and look at it and see if it matches our records, right? And if it doesn't, maybe we get, this is some kind of problem. And then if there's something that, like I, I mentioned the Pararuku skins. So we went from importing 2,000 every single year, Pararuku, this very unique fish in the Amazon that has a six foot long, beautiful skin that they use for the leather trade. We went from importing 2,000 every year to last year we imported 17,000. And I said, well, what happened? I mean, are there that many fish in the river? I mean, that's a lot of, that's a lot of skins from, it was a single fish, right? So um, it, it sparked my interest and now I'm starting to look closely at those imports in the United States. So it's a great tool to mine out data and maybe focus some efforts and a little closer look at certain trade issues, um, what's going on, right? So, um, you know, you can also look at the eel example I gave you, all those eels being smuggled to China. You can go on CITES.org right now and see that China's not reporting any of that trade when they should be because it's CITES species, right? So somehow China is reporting the export of these species, but they never reported the import. And the reason why they're not import importing the imports is because it was all smuggled into their country. So that should lead China to the conclusion that we have a problem, right? This is European species. We have it going out, but there's no trade coming in. That makes no sense. So there's a lot of data you can derive from there. Uh, so that's the one international system that I can speak to. And every year at the, at the um, CITES meetings, all these countries get together in Switzerland or other places. Uh, hopefully Brazil will host one of these meetings some year. 
Um, but these countries all get together and discuss trade issues, and they're always talking about the CITES report, right? So they're saying, well, hey, what's up, China? Why are you reporting this and not that? Why is this match? So there's, they use it as a, as a tool. And it's, it's probably the only one I can tell you exists. Um, now, we do have, um, I have my own database for the United States. So right now I can go into my database and tell you uh, everything that got imported from Brazil last year. I can tell you right now, it's going to my system as well. You know, uh, Brazil has their own databases and you'll learn more about that this week, but that's one of the issues in Brazil is that there's no centralized database. And I think that's one of the problems that, that, that really needs some work here in Brazil. Um, uh, for instance, one of the things I'm trying to learn is how much illegal trade is there in Jaguar? Well, I really can't get an answer because Highway Patrol seizes Jaguar sometimes. Uh, hey, Sector the Federal seizes Jaguar parts sometimes. Obama seizes Jaguar parts, right? But they're not all going into a centralized database. So Brazil, I can ask Brazil how much illegal trade is going on Jaguar, and they really can't get that answer because they don't have a central database to get that pull that information. But each one of your agencies in, in Brazil has that information in their own databases. It's mining that out and uh, getting that data together and seeing where the problems are, right? So they can't really combat that together until they all know what's going on. If Obama doesn't know how many Jaguar parts Highway Patrol is seizing in Brazil, then they don't, they don't really have the data or the information to combat it. So that, that's a big problem. And we have the same problems in the United States. Yeah. Uh, so California, Fish and Wildlife, right? The state, Estado, the Agency de Estado in Estados Unidos, California, Wildlife Department. They have their own database and I don't have access to it. <laughs> so, you know, at, on the federal level. So we could be doing things on the federal level and we're not, you know, we don't know what's going on. The same suspect had problems in the state of California, right? So we got to work together with these different agencies but it's difficult because even in Estados Unidos, we don't have a central database. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's, it's difficult to, to sometimes uh, work the cases and get all the data you need. Well, Brian, thank you very much for being here with us today. It's always an honor to have your support. Uh, if you want to give you a few uh, final words for our participants, they're going to be uh, looking to solve some of these issues for you with us, with us so we can wrap it up today. Sure. Um, I just sent my email in the chat box uh, this weekend or afterwards if you have uh, questions. Uh, I read Portuguese better. If you email me, uh, I'd be happy to help you if you have questions. Uh, but I will be uh, participating over the weekend. I'm going to probably work as a judge after with these projects. Um, so if you want to confer with me by email over the weekend or otherwise, por favor, yeah, please do. Uh, I'd be happy to help. Um, but I appreciate you um, listening to the presentation. Hopefully it gives you some pers perspective uh, more globally of, of the issues. You'll hear more about Brazil-centric issues in the coming days and um, again I'm just uh, happy to help you I'll be participating over the weekend reach out to me anytime and I'm looking forward to seeing your projects uh, at, at the end awesome Pessoal, então a gente encerra por aqui hoje, não esquecendo que amanhã tem mais um live às sete da noite, amanhã começa às sete Uh, a gente vai ter a Juliana da Freeland, que o Brian acabou de mencionar. Uh, também o Paulo Demati, da Polícia Rodoviária Federal de São Paulo. A Juliana Suma, diretora de divisão de fauna da DEPAV. Uh, o Daniel Carvalho, que é uh, analista ambiental do IBAMA. Uh, e o Daniel Ikinaga, que é a analista de dados, cientista de dados da área de tecnologia, trazendo um pouco para a gente num painel os desafios uh, também para combater uh, o tráfico animal. Uh, e, né, obrigado por todos por ficarem aqui. Lembrando que esse live vai ficar gravado no nosso YouTube. Uh, compartilhem com seus times. Se você não tem time ainda, não se preocupe. A gente vai 
na cerimônia de abertura, a orientar vocês em todo o passo a passo de como vai ser o Hackathon nesse fim de semana. Eu vi aí que já tem gente perguntando a tecnologia que vai usar, né? Se vai usar a... Deixa eu até puxar aqui quem que foi. Uh, alguém perguntou se ia usar Machine Learning, uh, agora não consegui achar aqui no chat, uh, mas né, uh, não foquem, por enquanto, na solução que vocês vão criar no fim de semana, e sim uh, nos problemas, e amanhã, provavelmente, uh, vocês já vão começar a ouvir, né? vocês já estão ouvindo aqui nos lives, mais a fundo, quais são os challenges desse ano do Zoo Hackathon, e a gente vai poder uh, começar a abrir muita coisa do que o Brian falou hoje, do que o Alexandre falou ontem, uh, e do que a Juliana falou na semana passada, vão estar tá dentro dos desafios desse fim de semana. Então, garante aí que todo o teu time assiste uh, as palestras, warm-ups, né, no nosso esquenta do Zoo Hackathon. Lembrando que, para quem não se inscreveu ainda, Zoo Hackathon .waas, e a gente se vê amanhã às sete da noite. Tchau, tchau.